Intangibles. It's a word that, by definition, defies definition, and it's used all the time in the world of professional baseball. No one knows for sure when the term was first used, but the idea that some players' contributions simply can't be measured goes back a long way. Maybe all the way back to Eddie Stanky, a shortstop who played on five major league teams over 10 years. Dodgers manager Leo DeRocher said of Stanky in a 1950 scouting report, he can't hit, can't run, can't field. He's no nice guy. All that little SOB can do is win. In addition to hitting, fielding, and running, generations of baseball scouts have given credence to the can't-quite-put-your-finger-on-it gut feeling that this guy has it. These days, however, they're not the only ones in on the decision. Today we'll hear from Professor Shrikant Datar about his case entitled The Oakland Athletics, Strategy and Metrics for a Budget. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Shrikant Tatar is an expert in the areas of cost management and management control, strategy implementation and governance. He also developed two new courses at Harvard Business School on developing mindsets for innovative problem solving and managing with data science. And I think those courses are highly relevant to the case we're going to talk about today. Shrikant, thanks for joining me. Pleasure, uh, Brian. Lovely to be here. I think a lot of people uh, will recognize, obviously, this case from the movie that came out a few years ago, Moneyball. Very funny movie with Brad Pitt, and uh, and I can't remember who else, but great movie. People liked it. Yeah. But here, you know, you, you come at this from a very different perspective and one that makes it a topic worthy of discussion in the MBA classroom. So I want to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But Looking forward to it. Maybe you can just start by setting the case up for it. Who's the protagonist and what's on his mind? So the protagonist in the case is Billy Bean. He's the general manager of the Oakland A's. The case is situated at the time of the 2002 player draft. Oakland is a low-budget team and has been competitive. And Billy Bean wants to draft players that would uh, help him win and while keeping his budget low. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I should point out that uh, it is the fall here in New England, and, and our own Boston Red Sox are in a pennant race. So uh, this feels very timely to me. And the Oakland A's are in uh, <laughs> in contention for the playoffs. In fact, are almost certain to make the playoffs uh, despite right. being a low-budget team. That's right. Exactly right. What prompted you to write this particular case? Uh, so I use it as an introduction in my course on managing with data science to show that data can change the way you manage, but it raises all manner of organization issues that need to be managed at the same time. Uh, it's interesting, as I was looking at the case and working on it, Baseball, as it turns out, has a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And yet it seems as you look at uh, what Billy Bean was doing at that time that much of the data wasn't being used. And the interesting question is, could it be used? Uh, Could it be used profitably? What challenges does it pose? And if you were going to use it, will it make a difference? So that's all those topics are what we talk about in the case. And Billy had some specific things he was trying to accomplish here. What were some of his strategic goals You know, it's very interesting the way Billy Bean uh, frames the question. He says, I want to recruit players who will help the A's win. And at one level, you look at it and say, yeah, sure, that's how everyone ought to be deciding uh, how to recruit players. Uh, You want to recruit players who will help you win. But at that time in baseball, and I'd say to some extent continues now, there was a great deal of emphasis around No, I don't think you can really do that. I don't think you can really figure out how do you recruit players who can win. What you can do is figure out players who are talented. Mm -hmm. And you just choose the best athlete and they will help you win. The idea that you would actually try to use data to say you can actually focus on winning rather than selecting the best player. And what is very interesting in the case is that there are players who are seen to be very talented who then do not get picked by the A's uh, is a very interesting way to think about data and to think about organizations. And this gets back a little bit to uh, what I was reading about in the introduction, the notion of intangibles. If you look at baseball scouting, traditionally, how has it been done? How do they make these decisions? The, the most common model used to be you evaluate a player on five tools. 
and at at some level, there's really nothing wrong with those tools. Uh, and I'm talking now about people who would be uh, the hitters, and you would have a different set of tools for pitchers. But for the hitters, the ability to hit, it's your batting average. Can you hit for power? Mm. Uh, can you get home runs? You know, it's always a good thing. Can you run? You know, this important base running and running in the field. Can you field? That would include catch. And can you throw? And it seems as though that ought to yeah. be a very good. Uh, <laughs> those looks like pretty good, pretty good things. <laughs> pretty to look good at. Pretty good things to look at. And that if you did look at those, and if you evaluated a player on those, then why bother with the rest of these uh, data statistics that were there? So that's how they were doing things. And uh, Billy Bean was challenging that notion in part. And this is always an interesting part of the case. I, one doesn't really know in the end whether it's the reason why he begins to think about it differently. But uh, Billy Bean himself was a very good baseball player. Mm. And he was... Uh, seen to have all these five tools. In fact, he was seen by scouts at the time he was a player as a uh, can't-miss player. Yeah. I mean, he was just, like, uh, terrific. And it turns out he did pretty badly yeah. in the major leagues as a baseball player. Right. He did fantastic as a manager afterwards. I always have wondered whether the fact that he was rated so highly on those very tools and that he didn't actually, he didn't actually work out uh, caused him to... Rethink nothing like personal experience to learn from and grow from, but to his credit, he does. He certainly does yeah. that. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that they capture an awful lot of data about baseball. There are whole almanacs that are devoted to the game, and you've got these people at the games who are actually keeping their own scorecards, and they're submitting that to Major League Baseball afterwards. So it's definitely a data-intensive yeah. crowd. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about Bill James and Sabermetrics, because that was really the core of the story around behind Moneyball. It's very interesting. Uh, Bill James actually worked as a warehouse clerk, but he was uh, fascinated by baseball. It was interesting to him that no one seemed to use that data systematically. So that, I would say, is one important part of how Sabermetrics comes about. It's uh, around the Society for American Baseball Research. That's where the word Saber comes from. And metrics are the kind of data that these folks who were very interested in statistical research were looking at. James then starts producing these uh, baseball abstracts, as he calls it, and they were very thoughtful treatises on what else you could do with the statistics that were available in uh, baseball. But I think James does uh, two things, and I'd love to just uh, use a couple of quotes from the case sure. around what James does. Uh, he says, the problem is that baseball statistics are not pure accomplishments of men against other men, which is what we're in the habit of seeing them as. They are accomplishments of men in combination with their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Context matters. And uh, so when you're thinking about wins, it's just not that a person's a very good player, but you've got to think about how would you put that in the context of a team and yeah. what you're doing. And his other uh, interesting question was, and which I use a lot in my course, is anytime you're thinking of using data, there's a lot of data available, but do you have a very good question to ask? And until you have a very good question to ask, data can help you to some extent, and you certainly can use data to think about interesting questions, but it's much more effective when you have a good question to ask, and then you can really look at the data and say, does it make sense or not? Yeah. And I have this, again, uh, short quote around uh, James, which says, I do not start with the numbers any more than a mechanic starts with a monkey wrench. Uh -huh. I start with the game, with the things that I see there, and the things that people say there. And I ask, is it true? Can you validate it? Can you measure it? How does it fit with the rest of the machinery? And for those answers, I go to the record books. Now, it's remarkable that despite all the records that have been kept around uh, baseball, not much thought had been given, how might you actually use it? Mm -hmm. And then he comes up with a number of very interesting uh, metrics that, uh, you know, were not being looked at. Yeah, so what are a couple of those beyond just the hitting and the running and the fielding? The thing that he's obviously most well known for uh, that becomes a bit of an adage uh, afterwards is that a walk is as good as a hit. 
because you get to first base uh, whether you hit the ball <laughs> successfully. And, you know, on that point, Ed Stanky, who I mentioned in the introduction, yeah. had the most walks five years in a row in the National League. He walked 100 times in one year. So he was looked at if it, just on a you know value basis. If yeah. you look at it from this perspective, he yeah. was the most valuable player in the National League at that time. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and if you look at the way the statistics went at that time, it wouldn't have shown up as a very uh, good statistic. So... James, in his analysis of what does it take for a team to score runs and wins, comes up with this analysis around how important on-base percentage is. This wasn't a very well-known statistic uh, before. Then he begins to start thinking about uh, this, which again, things that we now take for granted, but at the time were not uh, so slugging uh, average, you know, because he's just thinking, what does it take to score wins? How do you get runs scored and how many bases can you get? So slugging and then what became known later in his OPS, where you take slugging and uh, also on base. And so he started looking at all these metrics and then trying to figure out whether if I use some of these other metrics, are they better predictors of wins and runs than the metrics that were used before? And he finds remarkable causation, correlation, however you might want to think of it. And uh -huh. There's always that little debate. But I think it's very powerful evidence that some of these variables that he began looking at provided better explanation of why teams score runs and wins. Yeah, and so the case uh, takes us sort of into the bowels of the Oakland A's Coliseum, the stadium where they yeah. play baseball. And, yeah. and, uh, and you describe a conversation that's playing out between the traditional baseball scouts at the A's yeah. and Billy Bean's new cadre of people that are using sabermetrics. Yeah. How does this change the dynamic of that relationship? So this is uh, one of the most important points that we dwell on in the context of the case discussion because as you start getting this data – how do you begin to think about what do the scouts add? Is it like I can just look at data and forget about the scouts? So that's a little bit of the tension that we try to discuss. Or can it be done in addition to the scouts? And what are those challenges? And of course, students very quickly like to think of it as it can be done in addition to the scouts. And eventually, that's where we'll end up. But we push quite hard to argue that that's not so easy to do because you've got these scouts who have a lot of expertise, a lot of experience. They've played the game. They know what it is to uh, see a good player when they see one. And they've done this repeatedly many, many hundreds of times. You know, they're going from one uh, little town to another to try and watch all the players who they might uh, recruit, either from college or... Uh, uh, and after watching hundreds of them, they have two or three that they hope that a scout would say, you know, that was my guy that we eventually took and he's competing against other scouts and trying to uh, figure all this out. But they also have their own biases. So you might have a bias around the status quo. You're already always used to evaluating a player in a particular way. So you, on the one side, you have all the strength. And on the other side, you have all these biases. So you're yeah. overconfident. You're, uh, you think about the status quo. And... Then the tension is around, okay, the data folks are saying, yeah, this person but has much better statistics in the new way of doing things. Those are not necessarily the statistics that the scout in watching a game is focused on right. nearly as much. Yeah. And it often happens that, <laughs> these are always interesting discussions, uh, Brian, that the player may not look like a player that you associate with a good baseball player. Yeah. He might have fantastic statistics. He just doesn't look the part. Right. And uh, do you go with the statistics or do you go with what you're seeing with your own eyes? And that's the big tension in the case. And, of course, where we want to have students uh, pause and think about is first what the benefits are of what the scouts bring and what the data brings and uh, how might you bring it together but how organizationally, and that's true whether you're in baseball or in other organizations, once you have this kind of data and you're running, because the data is not perfect either, Brian. Right. So the data has got all sorts of probabilities. You have what we like to call false positives, false negatives. You think a player will be very good, turns out not to be. You don't take a player, turns out to be very good. So it's not automatic that just because I select the person's good and if I reject the person is not good. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you always get into this interesting discussion that, you know, that the guys doing the data have not played much baseball. You right. Know, they're data guys. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's a stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, certainly in terms of their respective skills, they're very different. And yeah. even though they bring stuff to it, organizations have a 
tough time trying to deal with that challenge and in the very first class where this case is taught, I just want to expose students to that tension that we'll continue to revisit throughout the course. And it sounds like what you're saying to some extent is, you know, there's validity to both of these approaches and you can make the best decision if you kind of bring all of that information together to help you drive your decision. Uh, the case at that point transitions, uh, Brian, into thinking about three circles or three parts of a Venn diagram. And we always say at the end, it's in the intersection of those three circles that the best data science is done. Mm -hmm. And the case really helps you get there because you can actually see each of these circles play out. So one circle is the computer science folks. You know, they are know about the data, they can manipulate the data, they can extract data, they can uh, scrape data, you know, they yeah. can do a lot of things with data. On the other circle is the statisticians, the knowledge of mathematics. How might you combine this data in interesting ways to get interesting insights, but just from a data analytic point of view. But the third circle, which we emphasize a fair amount, is uh, domain knowledge. Uh, what do you know about the problem you're trying to solve? How, what do you know about why this data might help you solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And if you miss all, if you do not have in a good data science application, all three of these uh, attributes coming together, you'll either get irrelevant predictions, you'll get static uh, research. You really do need the scouts bringing that domain knowledge. You do need the data folks coming up with the data and you do need the statistical analysis all working together. Mm -hmm. But therein, of course, lies the challenge in modern organizations because for the most part, those two circles haven't been as prominent as we have seen in the last 10 years where data science has continued to play a much, much bigger role. Yeah. So there it is, the lesson for people who are not just general managers of baseball teams, but general managers, generally speaking. <laughs> right? Very much so. Great. Srikant, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Brian, for having me. If you enjoyed hearing about the Oakland A's case, you might want to check out other episodes of Cold Call. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School.